Good morning and welcome to St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church. This is our Sunday service for the 10th Sunday after Trinity. Our opening hymn will be number 276. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm for this Sunday is Psalm 49. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. 
I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble, when the iniquity of those who cheat me surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? <laughs> Truly no man can <laughs> ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. <laughs> <laughs> For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain, he is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people approve of their boasts. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol, with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him, for though while he lives he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers, who will never again see light. Man in his pomp yet without understanding like the beasts that perish. Glory to the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forevermore. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Have mercy, Lord, have mercy, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, among men worship you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of God the Father. Have mercy on us. You alone are Lord, you alone are Christ with the Holy Spirit, the Most High in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray our collect for today. Almighty and everlasting God, who by your Holy Spirit revealed to us the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, we beseech you to quicken our hearts that we may severely receive your word and not make light of it or hear it without fruit as did your people, the unbelieving Jews, but that we may fear you and daily grow in faith in your mercy, and finally obtain eternal salvation. 
We ask this through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord. Our first reading for this 10th Sunday after Trinity comes from the second chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, verses 17 through to 26. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labours under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. And to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases him. Only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second reading for this tenth Sunday after Trinity comes from the third chapter of St. Paul's Epistle to the Colossians, verses 1 through to 11. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above and not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. But put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you were living in them, but now you have put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from the mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no... Not Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And our gospel reading for this tenth Sunday after Trinity comes from the 12th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, verses 13 through to 21. Glory be to you, O Lord. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide my inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter between you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of all his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So in the, so is the one who lays up treasures for himself is not rich towards God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Having now heard the words of our Lord, let us confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, who for our sake also was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We now sing our next hymn, number 275.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we continue our sermon series by going through the Augsburg Confession, and today our sermon shall be based on the ninth article of the Augsburg Confession concerning the topic of baptism. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The ninth article of the Augsburg Confession deals with the topic of holy baptism. The original draft of the confession was the original draft of the confession contained an approval of infant baptism and a rejection of the Anabaptists who denied infant baptism. However, in his 404 articles for the Diet of Augsburg, Johann Eck had accused the Lutherans of denying the efficacy of baptism. He argued that the Lutherans taught that baptism was unnecessary for salvation. Thus, in response to this, Philip Melanchthon added in a line declaring baptism to be necessary. In the German version of the confession, the line simply reads, Baptism is necessary, while the Latin version reads, Baptism is necessary for salvation. Eck's accusation against the Lutherans is based on a quote which he attributed to Luther and Melanchthon. The quote reads, Baptism neither justifies nor profits anyone. The quote reads, Baptism neither justifies nor profits anyone, but it is only faith in the word of promise to which baptism is added that accomplishes this. Eck interpreted this quote to say that the Lutherans considered baptism unnecessary, but this is not what the Lutherans meant by this quote. To understand the true meaning of this quote, and how it does not conflict with the teaching of the Augsburg Confession, that baptism is necessary for salvation, requires us to explain how baptism saves. In Romans 8.28 and Ephesians 2.8, St. Paul confesses that we are justified by grace alone through faith alone. By faith alone is a person saved. Yet St. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.21 that baptism saves. Those who follow a papist worldview teach that in order that one may teach baptism saves, you cannot say faith alone saves. Yet somebody who has a Baptist worldview teaches that in order to teach faith alone saves, one cannot say, baptism saves. Lutherans, however, in agreement with scripture, teach that faith alone saves and that baptism is necessary for salvation. For not only does St. Peter teach us that baptism saves, but in John 3 verses 3 and 5, Jesus declares that one cannot enter the kingdom of God, God unless they are born again of water and the Spirit. That is, one cannot be saved unless they are baptised. The answer as to how one can confess that baptism is necessary for salvation, and yet simultaneously teach that we are saved by faith alone, lies in the text of Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Here, St. Paul confesses that through baptism we are raised to new life, with, with, St. Paul confesses that through baptism we are raised up to new life with Christ through faith in the powerful working of God. That is to say, we are saved by baptism through faith. Baptism saves, but baptism saves through faith. This then is what the Lutherans meant when they said that ba that they are saved by baptism, sorry, when they said that baptism justifies no one, but that we are justified by faith alone to which baptism is added. Baptism by itself means nothing. It is not the washing of water that saves you, but the gifts offered in baptism, which are received in faith. Baptism offers to us numerous gifts. Chief among these are the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of our sins. The Holy Spirit comes to us through the means of word and sacrament to give to us the gifts of grace, faith, forgiveness and righteousness. 
through baptism, the Holy Spirit comes to us through water and the Word to instill in us the gift of faith, which allows us then to receive the gifts of grace, forgiveness, and righteousness. Faith alone saves, but baptism is a source through which we receive the Holy Spirit who gives us faith to which we are able to believe. Thus, it is not the mere act of baptism that saves you as the papists teach, but is the work of the Holy Spirit through baptism that ultimately saves you. This is what the Lutherans meant by their statement that baptism cannot justify anyone. The Lutherans were not attacking the necessity of baptism, but the papist false doctrine of ex opere operato in which they teach that the sacraments work to save us and forgive us our sins even apart from faith. The Lutherans were not rejecting baptism, but the belief that baptism can work and save us without faith. Thus the Lutherans held that baptism does indeed save us, but it saves through faith. We also teach that baptism is necessary for salvation as Jesus taught us in the Gospel of John. Therefore, Melanchthon continues in the Confession to declare that since baptism is necessary for salvation, one should baptize infants. If baptism is necessary for salvation, then why not baptize infants? For they too are in need of saving. The Scriptures teach us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Infants are included in this all, and thus they too require the means of baptism to receive the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of their sins. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Melanchthon takes a moment to condemn the Anabaptists who rejected infant baptism and to provide a defense of the historic Christian practice of baptizing infants. Melanchthon argues that infants are also in need of the gifts of salvation offered in baptism, and that when Jesus commanded us to go forth and baptize all nations, that infants are included in this all. For St. Paul taught that all have sinned, and 1 John 2.2 2 teaches that Jesus has atoned for all people. Infants are sinners, and Jesus died for their atonement then why shouldn't they receive the sacrament of baptism? The error that the Anabaptists made is that they considered baptism as something that we do for God. For the Anabaptists, baptism is a work of man, an act of choosing God, of confessing Him to be your Lord and your Saviour. If this were the case, then of course we shouldn't baptise infants because they lack the reasonable intellect to make a decision for Christ. As George Farrell wrote in his The Augsburg Confession, a contemporary commentary, if baptism is an act of public confession on the part of the person being baptised, then it is silly or even absurd to baptise infants. A weak old baby cannot make such a public confession of faith. But... If baptism is a means of grace in which the promise of the gospel is applied and sealed to the individual, then it does not really matter how old a person is to whom this seal is applied. The Baptists, the Anabaptists, have erred in two places. The first is that they considered baptism to be a work of man and not of God. But in the scripture, the work of baptism is always attributed to God. In John 3, verses 3 and 5, Jesus calls baptism rebirth by water and the Spirit. Here the work is attributed to the Holy Spirit. For just as an infant did not do the work of being physically born, neither does a person do the work of being spiritually reborn. For as St. Paul teaches in Ephesians 2, 1, prior to the Holy Spirit coming to us, we were dead in our trespasses. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, Paul refers to baptism as being washed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And in Titus 3.5, Paul refers to baptism as a washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It is always God doing the work. 
it is evident no better than in Ephesians 5.26, where Paul declares that Jesus has cleansed the church by washing her with a washing of water with the word. Here, Jesus is declared to be the one who did the baptism in order to sanctify the church. Baptism yeah. is not a work of the one being baptized. I think this is most evident in the fact that baptism is always something done to a person. During a baptism, the pastor, in the place instead of Christ, washes the candidate of baptism. Here, the pastor stands in the place instead of Christ, so that it is as if Christ himself was applying the water. If baptism was a work of man, something that we do for God, then why is baptism something done to us? It is some, if it is something that we are meant to do for God, then why don't we just get up and put the water on ourselves? Instead, the water is always applied to us, showing us that this work is the work of someone other than ourselves. The second error of the Anabaptists is that they consider faith to be a rational choice, something intellectual, and thus something that an infant cannot possess, for they lack that mental comprehension. However, in Matthew 18 verses 3 and 4, Mark 10, 15, and Luke 18, 17, Jesus states that in order to receive the kingdom of God, we must have faith like a child. And here, in the Greek, the word used is paedia, the Greek word used for children that were two and under. The same word that is used in Matthew 2.16 when Herod ordered the death of all the Padias, male children, who were two and under to be killed. Therefore, the scriptures teach us that infant can possess faith and thus they can receive the gifts of baptism. For baptism is not, for, sorry, for faith is not an intellectual reasoning. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith as an assurance of things hoped for, a certainty of things not seen. Faith is not based on scientific rationalism. Faith is a trusting in things hoped for, a belief in things that we cannot see and understand by fact alone. Faith is a clinging and a trusting to God, a belief that He will look after you not because of some rationalistic reasoning, but just because you trust in Him. Anyone who has had a child knows exactly how much an infant has an unquestionable faith in their parents to protect them and care for them. A child will cling to their parent with an assurance of things hoped for and a certainty of things not seen. Lastly, we come to the question of those who have died without baptism. If baptism is necessary for salvation, then what of those who died before being baptized? In answer to this, the church has made a distinction between an absolute necessity. In answer to this, the church has made a distinction between an absolute necessity and an ordinary necessity. Absolute necessities refer to the reception of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of grace, faith, forgiveness and righteousness, things that you absolutely must have in order to be saved. Ordinary necessity refers to something that has commanded that God has commanded us to do and in ordinary circumstances would be necessary, but in exceptional cases where such a thing is lacking, we can be saved in spite of it. The Church Father St. Augustine of Hippo taught that it is not the lack of baptism that damns, but the rejection of it. Baptism saves, and we have been commanded by God to be baptized. Therefore, if a person is able to be baptized, then they must do so. But if a person is unable to be baptized before their death, this this inability of baptism will not damn them. The scriptures give us two proofs in defense of this position. The first is seen in baptism's connection to circumcision. 
Martin Cabinets in his no. Martin Cabinets in his Enco Viridian question two hundred and forty seven asks Are then the children of believers who die before birth or in birth damned? Cabinets responds with a definite by no means and then proceeds to defend this by connecting baptism with circumcision. In Colossians 2, 11 to 12, Paul teaches that the sacrament of baptism has now replaced the Old Testament sacrament of circumcision as the new sacrament of initiation. In the Old Testament, circumcision is the sacrament by which men entered into the covenant with God and were saved. Both Jew and Gentile had to be circumcised in order to be considered part of God's people. Kemnet points out how in Genesis 17:14. God declared that those men who were not circumcised would be blotted out from the people of God. Cabinus goes on to explain that this lack of circumcision applied only to those who refused to be circumcised. Cabinus then points to the account in Exodus 4 where Moses returned to Egypt and God attempted to kill Moses because his son had not been circumcised. Note also that the, ages of, the age of Moses' son is never given and that since Moses... Note that the age of Moses' son is never given and since Moses had been in Midian for 40 years, Moses' son Gershom may have been in his 30s and yet had never been circumcised. Kemnitz teaches that those who reject circumcision were damned, but those who failed to be circumcised prior to their death were not. The best proof of this example the best proof of this is exampled The best proof of this is the example of David and Bathsheba's illegitimate son, who died in infancy in 2 Samuel 12. In verse 18 the child is said to have died on the seventh day thus prior to his circumcision. Yet in verse 23, David confesses, I shall go to him, he will not return to me. David believed that his uncircumcised child was in heaven and that David would one day see him again. It is not the lack of circumcision that damns, but it is the rejection of circumcision that damns. This principle then applies also to baptism. The second defense for salvation in spite of the lack of baptism is that we are saved by faith alone. Baptism saves, but it saves through faith. If one lacks baptism, they can still be saved as long as they possess faith. In Mark 16:16, 16, 16, Jesus says that those who are baptized and believe will be saved, but that those who do not believe are condemned. Jesus does not... Jesus does not mention the lack of baptism as the factor of that damns, but the lack of faith is what damns. Baptism does not save apart from faith, but is instead a source through which faith is received. It is then that received faith that it saves us. Faith can also be received through other means. Chiefly, Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. Therefore, all who have heard the gospel are able to have, are able to possess faith, including children in the womb. Modern science has confirmed that children in the womb can hear. But scripture confessed this long ago that infants in the womb could possess faith and thus were able to hear. Thus science has merely confirmed something that the scriptures have taught us for millennia. In, fir in, Luke, in Luke 1, 44, the unborn John the Baptist leapt in the womb when Mary spoke the words of greeting, demonstrating the faith John possessed prior to his birth. Also in Jeremiah 1, 5, the prophet speaks, the prophet speaking of the Lord, speaks of the Lord knowing Jeremiah while still in his mother's womb. And in Isaiah 49, 1-5, he, the prophet here speaks of the Lord calling him while he was still in his mother's womb, showing us that both Jeremiah and Isaiah were believers while still in their mother's womb. 
Thus, those in the womb are the same as those outside of the womb. Some have faith and will be saved, some lack faith and will be damned. Thus, Chemnitz ends his question 247 with the advice that we cannot bring unborn infants to baptism to receive the promises offered here. Therefore, we bring them these promises through preaching and praying for them. And he ends by saying that parents should keep this in mind so that if the case occurs where their child dies prior to baptism, that they are able to be encouraged and comforted. All this is not to do away with baptism. Remember that we that remember that Christ has commanded us to be baptized, and we do teach that baptism is necessary for salvation. For in ordinary circumstances we should be baptized, but in extraordinary circumstances we commend these people to the mercy of God. As Willard Orbeck wrote in his studies in the Lutheran Confessions, the exceptions are in the sphere of God's mercy. We don't use exceptions to make the rule. Salvation apart from baptism is something that is left to the mercy and grace of God and not to the whims of man. Therefore we confess in agreement with scripture that baptism saves and that baptism is necessary for salvation. Amen. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We now sing our next hymn, number 279. shall I offer to the Lord for all his goodness to me. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will offer to you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the court of the house of the Lord, in your midst of Jerusalem. Amen. Let us.
let us now offer up prayers for the church and the world. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the gift of baptism, through which you have sent to us your Holy Spirit, to give us the gift of faith, by which we then receive the gifts of grace, forgiveness and righteousness, and the gift of eternal life. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be ever mindful of our baptism, to look to it, to be reminded that we are your children, and that we have been saved. We pray, Lord, that you will allow us to take this great means of grace to those around us, so that we can administer to them the sacraments also. We pray, Lord, for our international communion, the confessional, orthodox, evangelical, Lutheran communion. We pray for our sister congregations, the Augustana Evangelical Lutheran Church in Denmark, the St. Nicholas Evangelical Lutheran Church in Texas, and the St. John's Lutheran Mission in Indiana. We pray, Lord, for our members there, that you would protect them and uphold them in your word. We pray particularly at this time for David, that you would be with him as he struggles with his health, and that your healing hands would be upon him. We pray that you would uphold him in your spirit. We pray also for David and Nolan as they are seminarians, as they continue to study in preparation for examination and ordination. We pray for our ministers, Pastor Zabel and Pastor Sorensen, that you would bless them in their ministry and look after them and help guide them so that they may preach your word in truth and administer your sacraments rightly. We pray also for Pastor Orphan and his congregation in Nigeria as he continues to undergo preparation for a colloquy with us. We pray that you would bless his studies, Lord, and help him as he serves his congregation. We pray also for the pastors and congregations of the Confessional Lutheran Ministerium as we look to engage with them in official church dialogue. We pray that you would bless our conversation and that we may one day enter into fellowship. We ask, Lord, all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. We now sing our next hymn, number 278.
God, you shall have no other gods. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You shall honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his cattle, or his donkey, or anything else that belongs to him. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments rest all the law and the prophets. This is the law of God. Thanks be to God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, having now confessed the law of God, let us draw near to God our Father with a true heart to confess our sins and how we have transgressed his law, asking in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my sins to the Lord. And he forgave the guilt oh. of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, helpless sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have displeased you, and I earnestly repent of all the evil I have done. By nature I am born sinful and unclean, and I have deeply displeased you in thought, word, and deed. I am deserving of your punishment in time and in eternity, but I am heartily sorry for my sins. And I ask you for the sake of the holy, bitter, and innocent sufferings and death of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only begotten Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become the children of God and has given them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this, O Lord, to us all. Amen. Amen. I ask you in the presence of God who searches the heart, do you confess that you have sinned and do you repent of your sins? I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed you from all your sins and do you desire forgiveness in his name? I do. I do. Do you intend with the help of the Holy Spirit to live as in God's presence and to strive daily to lead a holy life even as Christ has made you holy? I do. I do. I do. Christ gave to his church the authority to bind the sins of the unrepentant and to loose the sins of those who repent. Susanna, upon your confession, I as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce you the grace of God in the place and stead of Christ. And by his command, I absolve you of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. David, upon your confession, I as a called and ordained stern of the word, announce you the grace of God. In the place and stead of Christ, and by his command, I absolve you of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Marcy, upon your <laughs> confession, I as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce you the grace of God. In the place and stead of Christ, and by his command, I absolve you of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Devon, upon your confession, I as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce you the grace of God. 
in the place and set of Christ, and by his command I absolve you of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Nolan, upon your confession, I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce you the grace of God, in the place and set of Christ, and by his command I absolve you of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ said that whoever repents and believes is not condemned, but whoever does not repent and believe is condemned already. God forbid that any of you through impenitence or unbelief reject his grace and forgiveness and your sins therefore remain unforgiven. May he comfort you with his holy absolution and strengthen you with his sacrament. Go forth and sin no more. Peace be with you. Amen. We now sing our next hymn, number 280. Places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we adore and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, <coughs> heaven and earth are full of your glory. in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, and I, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after the supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy precious blood strengthen and preserve you in body and soul for life everlasting. Go in peace. Mm. Amen. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. A light to reveal you to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forevermore. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Hallelujah! <coughs> for his steadfast love endures forever. Hallelujah! Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this healing gift, and we pray that through it you would graciously strengthen us in faith towards you and in love towards one another. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. God be praised forevermore. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen, amen, amen. We close with our final hymn, number 277.